Hello, welcome to my studio. In this video, I'm going to be going over the formal drawing techniques, gesture drawing, blocking out the masses, scribbling the mass, and contour drawing. I'm also gonna be going over how to pull all of these techniques together. Let's get started. So for my model, I'm going to be drawing my hand and my arm. I've rolled up my sleeve so that I can see my whole arm. So I'm not gonna be just focused on drawing my hand, but how my hand relates to my arm. I would like for you to follow along. I'm going to be using large sheets of newsprint and vine charcoal. You can use whatever you have around, um, but make sure you roll up one of your sleeves and start following along with, um, with these exercises. All right, let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna go over is gesture drawing. So gesture drawing is the first few marks that you put on the piece of paper. They um, are used to tell their, Gesture drawing is your way of analyzing how the major masses fit together. Now, when you think of the term gesture, when it's not kind of being used in art language, a gesture is kind of an action, a recognizable action. So for instance, pointing is a gesture. Now think a little bit about what it means to do the gesture of pointing. Well, what it means is that no matter whose hand this is, the gesture is of a closed fist with a finger extended. So in other words, what makes a gesture a gesture is how the major masses relate to each other, not the individuals. Your finger can point, my finger can point. They may look different, but how they line up, the gesture of them is what makes it pointing. So even when it's not in related terms and relationship to drawing, it's still about how different parts fit together. So the gesture is kind of also can be thought of as that wire armature. Okay? So when we're looking at our hand, and let's start, I have my hand like here and I want to do a gesture of this hand. So as I look at it, a gesture is those first few marks that you put on the page. You want to draw how the major mass of my arm relates to the major mass of my hand and I want to do it as fast as possible. So a gesture is not a slow outside line contour drawing but something that just says, this is this direction, this is this direction. So if I'm looking at my hand, that would be the gesture. If I turn my hand back this way, that would be the hand, the gesture of my hand's relationship to my arm. Now, if you were to look at this drawing, nobody's gonna look at this and say, that's a hand bent backwards. But it's what you've decided, though it may not communicate anything to the viewer, what you have done is you thought to yourself, okay, what are the major forms or masses in, that I'm drawing? Well, I'm drawing my arm and I'm drawing my hand. Okay, how do they relate to each other? Well, they go here. This one is kind of horizontal, bent back slightly. This one is coming down at a slight angle. So you've made that observation but you've also made some other choices. You've decided where you're going to place this on the page and how big you're going to make it. Because for instance, I could have made my gesture this size, I could have made it this size, and I could have made it that size. Okay, so right off the bat, I'm deciding where I'm placing this on the piece of paper. Let's look at some more gestures. So I'm gonna bend my hand, and this time I'm gonna turn my hand in a little bit. So I'm also thinking about how my hand moves in space. I'm gonna turn it this way, move this way. And notice I'm doing all of these gestures with my hand closed. So I want you to follow along, and I want you to take a moment and take your hand Close all your fingers up, roll up your sleeves, and start twisting and posing your hand in multiple ways, trying to get uh, your hand, the angle of your hand to your arm. All right, the next thing we wanna look at is how our gesture, even the armature of our gesture, can imply the structure that it is sketching. So to do that, I want to grab kind of a, just a, straight up cylinder. Okay, when we look at our arm, we might think to ourselves at first 
that our arm is kind of like a tube. But when we stand it out, stand it next to a tube, we start to notice how it's different than a tube. Yes, they're both cylindrical, but our arm is not even. Now take a moment to feel your arm. And as you feel your arm, you'll notice, and if you look at um, images of your skeletal structure within your arm, you'll notice that your arm is, the lower half of your arm is made out of two bones. So it's not just one bone coming through here. It's, the bones are called the radius and the ulna, and they cross each other. So when your palm is lying, when your palm is facing you, those two bones lay alongside of each other. I'm grabbing some black pastel. So they lay alongside each other. When you turn your palm down, this radius crosses the ulna. So the radius crosses the ulna. So here they lay side by side, here they cross. And when they cross, all the muscles that kind of attach to them change their positioning. And one of the things you'll notice is that this crossing causes this arm um, to have kind of a diagonal running through it, okay? And then our bodies, the more you study our skeletal structure, the more you look and study human bodies, you'll notice that they're less like these tubes and they're more filled with kind of diagonals. And even our hand, our, our low, excuse me, even our lower arm has this diagonal built into it. Okay, how does this affect the gesture? Well, let's think a little bit. If I was drawing a tube, the gesture of a symmetrical cylinder, whether it's this uh, paper towel tube or this cup, is just a straight line. Okay, so if you think back to how you would draw this, you would start off with kind of a straight center line, figure out its height and its width. Okay. That's how you would draw this too. Your arm, when it's faced like this, is not a symmetrical form. Okay, so using a line that goes down the center is not really accurate. If we analyze the skeletal structure, this line, the gesture of our arm, should cut across the form. And that's really useful. So let's return back to gesturing this simple form right here. Start off with my hand, and I come down through my wrist. And you notice I angle my line. My, this line right here isn't coming down my arm. My outside of my hand is here. This would actually be the contour of my arm right out here. Okay, this would be the volume of my hand over here. Okay, so my gesture is not coming straight down like a stick figure, but it's coming out from one edge and cutting across the form diagonally and cutting over to my elbow. That way my gesture is truly an armature. It's truly following the structure, um, the bone structure of my arm. That means that your gesture is also now doing an additional measurement. So your gesture is not only telling you where you want it to be on the paper, but from this side to this side, it's giving you the width. So if we come back to the types of information that are in that simple gesture, we have not only the angle of the hand, where we wanna place it on the page, the size, meaning the length, we also have now included the width, okay? By going from this side to this side, I've given myself the width of the arm. And so you can see um, those first few marks that you put on the page contain a lot of um, concrete specific information so that when you're doing that gesture drawing, you're really taking um, specific notes that you can build upon. Right. The next thing I wanna do is continuing to look at gesture I want you to think about how a gesture, well, we keep describing it as an armature, so we think of it as living inside of the form. 
but a gesture drawing does not need, the lines of a gesture drawing do not need to just be inside the form. So I've been drawing with my hand closed. I'm gonna open up my fingers. Now, when I'm drawing my hand, remember that a gesture drawing's job is to be as quick as possible. So if I was drawing my hands like this, and I've got my, once again, I've got my arm coming across, I've got my hand. If I did a gesture for each individual finger, you can see already how long that took. It also wasn't as specific. So if I look at my hand, rather than think of individual gestures down each finger, I want to look for a more accurate way of getting those hands. And so if I put my hands like this, what I notice is that if I look at each, I, if I pick up the fact that I come across these knuckles, I can come across horizontally. I notice I can come across horizontally on my wrist here and that there's a line made by each of my knuckles and a line made by my next set of knuckles and an overall shape of my hand. So when stuff gets small, so I can kind of look at the overall shape of my fingers. And so here I'm doing a gesture, not through the form like I did here, but how one parts relate to the other. And this is really crucial for drawing the figure because very often when we're doing gesture drawing, we want to incorporate when we're drawing the figure, we want to incorporate horizontal, horizontal and vertical measuring. Um, and so we want to sketch and gesture and then measure. And by incorporating gesture drawings that talk about how one part relates to another, therefore maybe if your hands out like here, how your elbow, how the figure's elbow relates to the chest or how their feet relate to the head, if you start thinking about gesture drawings, it's not something that lives just inside the figure, but are also how one element relates to each other. You can sync it with your horizontal and vertical measuring with a little bit more fluidity. Gesture drawing is the first few marks that we put on the piece of paper. Therefore, we do some form of gesture drawing with every drawing that we start. So moving forward, you're going to see me do the simple armature draw, gesture drawings of my hands, look for the basic shapes, and then add more information. So the next thing that I wanna go over is blocking out the major masses. So let's return to a gesture drawing. So I'm gonna start off with my hand and pointing. I'm still gonna work with my charcoal, and I'm gonna look at the gesture I'm gonna go through the finger, through the wrist, down through the arm, okay? And so I've got the two major masses, finger, hand, and how they relate to the arm. Now, the next thing I wanna do is start to flesh out the volume of my hands. But I don't want to start adding a bunch of really detailed contour lines. So contour lines, those outside edges, are really complicated and really nuanced. And on the human figure, one contour edge, which may seem continuous, is actually usually made up by lots of interior masses, volumes coming together. So there's a little bit more that I wanna start to flesh out before I commit to my contour lines. Always remember that a contour line is an outside edge defining the shape of your figure. And the shape, if you only go and define the shape, your figures will always seem flat. So I wanna to start to get at the real volume of my figure. And so to do that, I wanna look at the major masses or volume. And the most obvious is my arm. So I'm gonna to start to kind of look at what is the overall volume of my arm. And I'm gonna start by looking at the kind of horizontal line where my arm changes direction at my elbow. And yes, I'm kind of loosely gesturing out 
an outside edge, but very quickly, I want to shift to just thinking about the outside edge and start to define the planar structure of this arm. Now let's look at that a little bit closer. I have my black pastel again. And if I look at my arm, it's not kind of a pear shaped like this is, even though the outside contour edge might look like that. But in, tier, in the inside, it's actually a flat plane like this, another flat plane like this that's kind of triangular shaped. And yes, it changes as I twist my hand, but from this point of view, there's another kind of planar shift here. So my arm, although kind of a smooth plane, planar shifts, is made up of all of these planar shifts. Now, if you're somebody who's interested in 3D modeling for video games, understanding these planar shifts is really crucial for modeling um, kind of 3D forms. Um, as we look at these 3D, these, these planar shifts, I want to indicate those planar shifts in my drawing right from the beginning. So sticking with this arm, I'm gonna kind of keep, there's a planar shift happening from here to here. The planar shift happening here. And then kind of a planar shift happening here. Now I'm using line to define my planar shift because it's the quickest way to define those planes. It also means that if I was drawing from observation, if I was drawing somebody from life, uh, I would know that that is where shadow patterns are gonna happen when I use lighting. So when we look at a form that has value and lights and darks within it, those areas of lights and dark happen across these planar shifts. So this is also acting as a shorthand to help me figure out shading later on. Okay, so I've got these planar shifts. Get my hand back. I have an overall volume of the hand. My hand kind of has this flat box-like shape. If I had this side, <laughs> if I had this side here, there'd be a side right in here. There's clearly a mass that is my thumb that is separate from my hand, okay? But that hand also has a top plane and a side plane. And each of my fingers have top planes and side planes. They're little boxes. Okay, so there's a side plane. Sometimes it's easier just to kind of Okay, so where I've touched the charcoal along the side of my fingers has created side planes. All right, so as I look at my hands, I see the flat volume of that part, the side of my hand here, the volume of my thumb, my thumb is coming off. And then as I start to add this finger, I don't want it to just become a straight up outside edge. I really want it to be three dimensional right from the beginning. So even if it causes it to be a little bit more blocky, I want to start to indicate these planes. Now I haven't gotten every single plane in there, but I've gotten quite a few of them. Once again, I'm not really, although my lines might touch the outside edges, I'm not trying to draw a contour line. I'm drawing from the inside of my figure out. So I'm really focused on getting this top plane of the finger versus the side plane of the fingers. This way, I start to have a road map right in my vine charcoal, which erases really easily, drawing a little dark so that you can see it, but in general, trying to stay light. This will give me the structure that then as I go through and put more detailed contour lines on there, I'll really know where one form is shifting, where I go from being a plane that is receding to a plane that is coming forward to a plane that is receding. I think of drawing these inside interior lines as, although they might seem awkward at first, they are just as logical as drawing the sides of a box. So remember that when you draw a box, 
I'm just going to draw a really generic box. You indicate planar shifts with line. You would not draw a box like this. Okay, You would just not be able to tell what that form is. The same thing, you should apply this same logic to drawing your hands, particularly when you're beginning the drawing. It doesn't mean that the drawing needs to end here, but it is the next step. So the first thing we've done is we've gestured out our um, forms, and then we've started to go through and apply the basic shapes, very quickly dividing those basic shapes into planes, into facets. All right, so we've gone over gesture drawing and blocking out the major masses in our hand. The next thing I wanna go over is um, scribbling the mass. Now, this is something that is kind of gesturing out volume, and it can be done instead of blocking out the major planes or kind of um, you can go back and forth between blocking out the major planes and scribbling the mass. Let's look at it. So scribbling the mass is when you are drawing your volumes and rather than kind of stay on those outside edges, you're really making lines that cut across the form, very similar to cross contours. Cross contours are just the line that scribbles out the mass. And they're, line, they're lines that come across your form horizontally. It is very important when we are drawing the figure and drawing our hands that our lines not only are what I would call vertical lines, lines that run along up and down the form or up and down the figure or on those outside edge. I usually think of those as vertical lines, um, not only because they sit on the paper vertically, but because they define the um, kind of vertical relationship of the figure to its outside environment. It's a little complex, but <laughs> bear with me. Um, I think it's very important that that not be the only way you describe your figure, in this case, your hand. You want to look for every reason for your lines in the marks on your paper to come into the interior mass where the real volume is. This has to do with the fact that when we're drawing on a two-dimensional surface, the hardest thing to do is to make it look three-dimensional. The hardest thing to do is not to make it look realistic or to make it look detailed. The hardest thing to do is to get space, three-dimensional volume on a two-dimensional surface. And vertical lines or lines that only define the outside edge will always be more flat than lines that come across the form and define that interior mass. And so you want to get into the habit of bringing your mark making and your lines and your cross contours, all of those things into the interior mass of what you're drawing, into the interior volume right from the beginning. So it's important to note that all the things that I'm going over right now are not something that you leave for two hours into the drawing. I am, I, we are looking at how you spend the first five minutes, two minutes, 10 minutes drawing. All right, so let's draw. So the first thing, let's see, I'm gonna put my hand out. We'll do some fingers out to get a little bit more complicated. So I'll do something like this. And the first thing I'm gonna do, start with my gesture. So I have my wrist in my hand coming down. Okay. And now I'm ready to look at the hand. I feel like there's a real clear direct line from that first pointer finger. So I could just kind of come out through here. It really feels natural. When it comes to the rest of the hands, the rest of the fingers. I don't want to do a gesture down each finger. I want to look for the gesture that happens within the between fingers. So I'm going to look at the overall volume and gesture between the fingers. And that brings me horizontally across this. And it makes me realize that this line is very similar to the line that's right here of my wrist. It's very similar to the line of my knuckles very similar to the line that's moving through the fingers. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to look for this horizontal line right across my um, wrist. I'm going to look right across my palm. Maybe I'll have my thumb in here. 
Let me get that tip up to this finger. And now I'm starting to slow down because this gesture is getting a little bit more complicated. It's hard to <laughs> draw and talk at the same time. But in general, that's my basic arm, hand, fingers, thumb out here. I'm gonna add some of those masses that I did in my last one, which I'm gonna look for planar shifts. There's a big planar shift in my wrist right here. There's a mass of my thumb, which is at a, slight, is at a different plane. I'm gonna get here. I didn't define that plane by um, a line. I did it by just a thicker line. That's this whole side of my thumb. So that wasn't, this is not my thumb. This is the plane of that thumb. Okay, stand up. And there's also, right from the beginning, getting the planar structure of here to here, because it would be really easy to lose that. And then my hand will look flat. If I can see the side plane here, then I add it. It's kind of just changing as I change my perspective. But this top plane is really important. So I have the horizontal line here, horizontal line here, and some horizontal lines here. Now I want to add what I would call scribbling the mass. I'm going to change to a um, compressed charcoal. I'm using it in a holder just because I have it. And I'm going to lightly start to think of get my hands in that position, the direction that these forms are going. Now, no, I didn't start here. I got here after the gesture. To me, when we're drawing the hands, we're all about the fingers, but the true, to me, the battle of the hands happens with one's ability to get that relationship of the wrist to thumb. Okay. Now, why am I doing this? Well, I'm doing this because drawing um, is not just about the final result, but drawing is also about learning how to study a form and understand it. So notice as I'm talking about my hand, I'm really getting in on how is, what is the structure of my hand? What is the bone structure of my um, arm? Um, what is the mass and volume and planar shifts? All of these are things that I'm noticing as I'm drawing. And I wanna continue to notice. So I'm starting to scribble out. Sometimes people call this slinky drawings. And you'll see it even in the early drawings of early sketches of really representational artists like Antonio Lopez Garcia. You'll still see these kind of like scribbled mass drawings where the artist is really trying to understand the form. And the directions of the form. Going back to my gesture, making sure I'm placing things the right way, and kind of continuing to gesture up the mouse. All right, this would be a quick demo on scribbling out the mouse. So we've looked at gesture, we've looked at um, blocking out the planar structure, we've looked at kind of scribbling out some of the major masses and incorporating horizontal lines into our form. Next up, contour lines. Now contour drawing is, or drawing the contour, is those outside edges. Now outside edges have a lot of specificity and nuance to them, and they give you a lot of really kind of detailed information. So of course you want them in your drawing. However, when you're working on the contour, remember that the purpose of doing a contour drawing is to define the shape. It is not to define the proportions. It's not to define the volume. It's not to capture the overall relationships of the masses or volumes. All of those things are done with other drawing techniques. 
and then contour lines tend to come on and add a lot of um, nuance and specificity and clarity for the viewer. For the artist, by the time they're really putting out those nuanced contour lines, they've really already done a lot of the analytical work of studying the figure and form. Okay, so don't rush to contour lines. They're for the viewer to understand the form. The gesture, analyzing the mass, and scribbling the mass are where you, the artist, really study and understand the figure. But there's lots of ways to think about contour drawings as well. As you notice, I'm keeping my hand in pretty simple shapes um, so that I can <laughs> talk and draw at the same time quickly. And so I'm gonna start off, and I'm gonna start off with a gesture because that's where I get my proportion and um, make all those decisions. But this time my gesture drawing is gonna be incredibly light so that it's easy to erase. Okay, now that I've got the basic gesture, it's almost kind of looking a little bit like a silhouette. I'm gonna add um, some of those planar shifts that I notice. And I'm not worried about being too blocky because I'm gonna come through with my contour and add a little bit of specific, more specificity. But this is my chance to really analyze the form. Okay, so once again, it doesn't have a lot of those outside clearly defined edges, but I've gone in and analyzed the planar shifts, the overall gesture, and I've tried to do it so light that it'll just erase like that. All right, now I'm ready for contour drawings. Now, when I'm doing a contour drawing, I really wanna be thinking of the difference between convex versus concave. I want to be thinking about whether the line is, the contour I'm drawing is near me, moving near me, or moving away from me. So if I'm drawing this edge right in through here, is it closer to me than this edge? Yes. Is this edge closer to me than this edge? Well, it's 50-50. Are there moments of pressure and contact? Um, is there a mention of tension? Um, so I'm looking for all of those things. All right, I'm gonna start, I like to start sometimes with the simplest. I'm gonna start down here, it's closer to me. I'm just gonna come in. I'm going real slow. So if I can't see my line, I can just touch it with my greenish hand. Okay, as I'm drawing, I'm thinking about whether something is hitting a bone, so it's hard, hitting flesh, so it's light, softer, hitting my nail, so it's nice and hard. Which side is pressing? pressing? I am not including closed contour lines, so I'm letting lines disappear and stay open. I'm letting them come into the interior of the form. Keep changing my perspective, so keep getting in stuff and then.
and I'm looking out for that convex versus concave thing that we've already talked about and letting something get softer and thicker to kind of imply a rounder feel as opposed to an abrupt shift. And yes, my contour line sometimes kind of come in a little bit. I find it's hard to not include, if I want something to have volume, to not include some of these interior planar shifts. Okay, so you can see I'm going through and I'm really thinking about dark to light thin to thick. If something seems like I've kind of gone over it a little too much and it's a little too high contrast, you can just kind of ease it back a little bit to make it seem further away as it can blend into the fog. This way. Okay, so you can see I'm working slower. Um, it's a little hard to draw so far away from myself. Um, but even when I'm just in the first few minutes of my contour line drawing, I'm moving around, I'm trying to always keep um, convex contour lines, and I'm thinking about where there are moments of pressure and tension. And of course my lines are coming in. We have used our hand and arm to examine formal drawing techniques such as gesture drawing, scribbling the mass, blocking out forms, and beginning with contour drawings. Now let's look at some artist versions of hands. Some of these drawings incorporate the techniques that we have been discussing, and some of these drawings take these ideas a little further. All right, the first image that I'd love to look at with you is a study, a group of studies by the artist Nicola Feshin. When we look at these gesture drawings, we're just looking at him probably drawing his own hands, and you can notice there's real personality in these hands. They are bent and twisted and pressing in on each other. They are old hands folding in. You get a real sense of the bone structure underneath. Now, Nicola Feshin is known for drawing the figure and drawing, in this case, these hands with kind of very similar drawing technique. He worked on a very rough paper and he worked with a large block of charcoal that he supposedly made out of the dust shavings of uh, off his easel. And those are kind of wadded up. And his gesture was made out of this kind of wad of charcoal. So the gesture in these drawings is not the contour, but this tonal work. So all this value that you're seeing underneath the line drawing is Fession's way of gesturing. After he had kind of worked out this loose um, way of working with a block of charcoal, he'd come in with these razor sharp uh, charcoal and put in these very specific contour lines. So he's known for having a really clear way of working, gesturing loosely in value with a block of charcoal, and then incorporating these really beautifully sharp contour lines. And his contour lines have really puncture, uh, get darker where they hit the bone, they disappear completely into the charcoal, they are very responsive to the form. Um, they're beautiful, and you really get a sense of and the hand pressing against itself, pressing up against another surface. So it's a beautiful study in not only capturing the structure of hands, but a way of making going from gesture to contour and maintaining that sense of pressure and touch and immediacy. 
This is a drawing by, you know, the well-known famous artist uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And I love this drawing. And one of the things I love about this drawing is kind of the power of drawing. Because drawing is such a modest material, it a lot of the tools that artists like Leonardo da Vinci used and we use are the same. This is just a piece of paper and charcoal, very similar to what we would use. And yet, because this drawing is such a direct, you know, his eyes, his mind to the paper, it still has the freshness as if, you know, it, as if you did it in your sketchbook an hour ago. Um, it has that quick, direct feeling. And I love the way um, each element, the line, the value, are very kind of sparse, but very specific. Take a moment as you're looking at this drawing, you have hands, um, lock them together. And as you interlock your hands, I want you to notice how your knuckles, as you kind of pull your hands apart, your knuckles kind of press into, um, the, your hands fit together, your knuckles press into the flesh of your hands. And there's that sense of these hands intertwining. A line becomes dark and then it disappears and then another finger takes over. So there's this beautiful sense of these fingers being interwoven together with the contour lines themselves. Dark, disappear, drawing this finger, disappearing into this finger, now defining this other finger. And so not only are you looking at the illustration of fingers interlocking, the lines go back and forth from one hand to the other hand to the other hand. Um, he also has this really great <laughs> fingernail right here. A lot of times um, when we're drawing, we'll, have, we'll gesture our hands, we'll draw our hands, and then we come to these fingernails. And because even though there's not a real physical shape change, distance change with our fingers. We'll draw these like huge blocks where we really make this like almost a tombstone shape on our fingers. And here he sees the fingernail as being attached to the finger. It's a, a line here, it disappears into the finger here, it's a line here. So the fingernail, while defined, not completely disappeared, is um, integrated into the hand so that it doesn't just feel like this sticker stuck to um, this hand. This is um, two uh, drawings um, by the artist Anto Antonio Lopez Garcia. Um, this piece of paper looks like it was digitally collaged. In fact, it was physically collaged. Um, this piece of paper was two pieces of paper collaged together. And so he took um, what appeared to be just quick studies of the hands and um, combined them into a finished drawing. Now, uh, Lopez Garcia is known for being the father of Spanish realism. So he's known for being um, a very photorealistic artist. Um, so for those of you who are interested in kind of photorealistic uh, life drawings, he's definitely somebody you should check out, as well as kind of the whole movement of Spanish realism. Um, I love this drawing because we see how a drawing begins. Even an artist who eventually takes a drawing and brings it into real sharp focus, we get to see what the first few marks of on the piece of paper. Here we get to see him scribbling the mass, loosely gesturing. Here kind of scribbling horizontally the wrist, um, sketching out this whole form in vine charcoal, giving attention to the forms that are closest to us, letting those fingers completely dissolve. And I love the way this looseness that's happening right here makes this hand feel like it's moving. So you have moments of the hand that are in sharp focus, so they're frozen, and the fingers feel like they're moving. So this, this gesture way of drawing, this loose gestural mark, not only is the way he is blocking out the form, but he's also using it as a way to show motion. So it's kind of using it as a visual um, note as well. The same is kind of happening with this uh, Louise Bourgeois uh, drawing. Here she is kind of scribbling out the mass, the interior mass of his hands. Here you have um, an older woman uh, looking at her hands, looking down at her hands, studying the structure underneath and almost building her hand from the skeleton up using these kind of scribbling the mass uh, marks where she's scribbling around the form, not only to study her hand, but as a kind of a visual style as well. <laughs> and I love the little note where she's kind of sewn in her name here. It really kind of shows you that while this drawing feels like it has a lot of looseness to it, feels like it was really immediate, it has kind of a patience 
to it as well, where you're kind of where she's really studying her hand as it ages and really um, looking at it from the inside out. This is um, etchings um, that are part of a series of an, the artist Henry Moore. Now Henry Moore is known as a sculptor. He does a, a magnificent, magnificent series of drawings of hands. This happens to be an etching of it. He has lots of ink drawings of this hand as well. And I love the way he's using this scribbling mark, but he's organizing it as well. So not only is this mark building um, the volume, but it's also building that atmospheric perspective where you have dark marks coming forward, light marks receding. And so he's using that scribbling mass also as a way to bring and organize his entire image. So um, lots of detail and lots of volume close up and then less and less and less as it moves into the page. There's also a real sense of pressure and touch in this drawing as well. So um, there's kind of a lot of different formal elements kind of coming together to support uh, one another. This is a series of um, hand sketches versus a finished drawing. This is a set of just kind of sketchbook uh, drawings um, by the artist uh, Van Gogh. And I think that as you look at each person's hands and as you think about how to draw your own hand, it's really important that you study the personality and the characteristics of your own hand as you look at um, this drawing, notice that there's a real kind of geometric, heavy, um, kind of um, real worked workman's hands feel to uh, Van Gogh's both choice of mark making and emphasis of volume. And this was not an accident. I mean, think about um, who Van Gogh is and how he wrote about kind of going into the field and drawing from observation and drawing with the reed that he had cut from the land. Um, notice how his one of some of his favorite subjects were the potato pickers and people working in the fields. That I, he really kind of embodied that idea that the artist was a worker who was really toiling for his work, and you see that in the depiction of his hands. Now this is a drawing, um, a study of by the artist Peter Paul Rubin. Now, Rubin is known for making very volumetric figures. Not only are his figures um, themselves usually pretty um, large, the way they are drawn is to really show a lot of volume. So his figures are very three-dimensional. And if we look at this quick study of hands, you can see how he's using value to show the real volumetric structure of the hands. Now this is on brown paper and you can see that he's put these deep dark heavy shadows so that you really see the planar structure and as you look at each of them you see not only is he doing the planar structure of the hands but he goes in is really defining the planar structure of these fingers and he's doing that right from the beginning. So as you look at these quick sketches you can see what is important to an artist even when they're only working on something um, for a few minutes. You know, it's very tricky when you're trying to analyze even this drawing up here of the face and this drawing of what is probably a cast. Because they are so refined, it's really hard to figure out what was, where did the artist begin? Um, what were the steps that were involved? But with these hands, they're so fast. They're just a couple lines, a couple smudges with some charcoal. And so you really see what is what the artist prioritizes. And Rubens, he likes volume, he likes his drawings to look very three-dimensional, and so he's really prioritizing showing planar structure. Now he is using value to do that planar structure, but you can also capture that planar structure right from the beginning of the drawing using uh, lines as well. Now when you are trying to capture and use value to show volume, you wanna think in terms of highlight, shadow core, and reflective light. And when we look at this study by Kindy Wiley, now this is a hand study done in oil paint, but it is still kind of um, what I would consider one of Wiley's um, drawings. So he does his drawings on paper in oil paint. Um, so it is a little bit more finished than just a quick sketch. But you can see in this drawing, he 
really wants that these hands feel incredibly solid, like they're very much touching this surface. So even though this surface right here has you know nothing but a few lines, this hand really feels like it's resting. The hand feels like it has a lot of not only physical volume, but physical weight. And one of the reason is that this image really feels like it's resting on that surface and that those fingers are really relaxed and resting on each other is because of reflective light. So if we look at this uh, painting, we can see, or painting sketch, whoops, you can see um, here is the highlight and he's using kind of a, um, a warmish light, but it's not as warm as the reflective light. Here is the shadow core. And it's very important to realize that the shadow core is kind of darkest, closer to the highlight. You can see that really clearly here. Here's that highlight of the light coming down. Here's a highlight of the light coming down. Here it is all along here. Then we make a slight transition, but we very quickly get darker into that shadow core. As the form continues to turn, as this cylinder-like finger continues to turn away, we get this reflective light. And in this, because this is also a painting, you can see he's made the reflective light very red. Reflective light does tend to be warmer. And this is something that you'll notice a lot when you draw from a model or you draw from a person. The reflective light, because skin is a warmer color, that reflective light does tend to be reddish. Okay, so reflective light is always warmer than the color it's reflecting, and since skin is warm, it becomes almost red. And you'll see this when you're drawing a really brightly lit figure. And so we have in here, we have highlight, shadow core, reflective light. Now reflective light is what makes a form, in this case this, these fingers, feel like they're interacting, feel like they're not in a vacuum, but that they're touching a surface and touching each other. And so these fingers feel particularly like they're resting because he's been so bold in his reflective light. So highlight, shadow core, reflective light. And yes, cast shadow is something we also see, but make sure you're always including reflective light within your um, forms, within your volumes. And you see that happening here as well. So here is um, a drawing kind of um, a drawing that has been kind of translated into a print. It's got, um, it's a combination drawing with uh, prints on top of it. Um, and you can see a Jordi really emphasizes that highlight shadow core reflective light, highlight shadow core reflective light, highlight shadow core reflective light. And each of these fingers feel like they're kind of touching one another because they have that great value shift across it. Now, when you're organizing, um, your information, make sure you prioritize um, information, lights and darks that show volume versus surface changes. And I love um, Barbara Walker's work. And um, this drawing is also something I just adore. And she is, you know, you ha she's drawing a figure who has lots of tattoos. Now tattoos are value changes on your skin, but they're not, um, they are light and dark color and or value changes, but they're not a physical change. And so it's really complicated to both honor the tattoos, make them visible because they're important to capturing the personality of these hands, but make the hands also feel three-dimensional so that the tattoos don't take away from the shading that is happening in um, his hands, so that his hands will th feel three-dimensional but also have a pattern across them. And she negotiates that so well. This drawing is such a great example of organizing complex information. She does the same thing in um, the t-shirt, kind of emphasizing the, the both the wrinkles in the shirt, but also showing um, the label and the, the imagery as well. So as you look at this, let's kind of deep dive into how she's displayed these tattoos, particularly across the fingers. Um, as you look at this S kind of curving around, you notice that it isn't just one s solid uh, value. It's not just all dark, but it's got areas of dark and light as it curves around. 
She's also organized her information so that over on this side, the tattoo is not as noticeable. It's only really noticeable in the fingers that are closer to us so that we get more of a sense of detail. Um, she's also de-emphasized the tattoo as we're moving back in space on the hand and then re-brought that information up into more focus in the top of the hand as well. Notice how the top of the arm, because it's closer to us, has higher contrast within the tattoo. As the arm bends, that contrast is re reduced. And so she is prioritizing contrast and value shifts that show volume and then adding um, what I would call superficial detail. A tattoo, while maybe important to include, is also a superficial detail. It's a value change that has no physical change. And so um, it's important that you kind of prioritize your information so that it shows vol volume as well. The same thing happens when we look at our fingernails. Um, our fingernails aren't this massive jump in, um, you know, a, a, they're not like, they're, they're only just a kind of a small little shift in surface. They're not this kind of massive cliff that needs a huge value sh shift or a huge um, sharp edge to define. One of the things that when we're talking about prioritizing information in this beautiful Sarah Siblet drawing, um, you notice that she is really using the hand as not only um, as like figures dancing around. So she's done a beautiful job kind of composing these hands and having you move from one hand to the next hand to the next hand. And she has used her line weight and sense of detail to help you move across the image. So as you look at all of these hands, they're not all in equal focus. They don't all have an equal amount of information in them, but she shifted how much information she's giving in one area, lots of detail to come forward, but also move you around the composition. And then we go from here, we follow the shadow line down through the palm, it completely disappears, and then we pick up. So she is using the organization of information not only to give us a sense of space, but to create movement and visual pathways throughout this composition. So um, these hands are becoming figures dancing across the page. And I think hands really have the power to have a lot of kind of, uh, to be figure stand-ins. Um, so in this <laughs> kind of amazing, creepy image, um, my Tambimo, who is an animator, and she's known for having kind of these hands in her animations that very clearly are um, almost people-like in the way they move around through her animations. Um, and so you can see them morphing into each other and becoming figure stand-ins. Um, and the way she composes this drawing, I mean, this artist is an animator, so she thinks about how you read an image and how you move across the page almost as a way to stand in for how you um, see like multiple scenes in um, an animation. So there's a real sense of movement in her work. Even though the line weight is pretty stiff, the composition is moving us through. You know, contrast that with this Sarah Siblet drawing where the gesture and the mark making and the layering has a lot of movement. The composition as well, but this drawing, the line weight is almost, there is, you know, light to dark lines, but it's pretty simple. And yet, because the composition is so off-centered, because we move from one form to another form, pick up, move over here, move around, come up to this creepy bug poking out of the flesh, and then are right back into the piece. Um, our eyes move through that composition and it allows this line to be really animated. In all of these pieces, I want you to notice the personality of the hands and how the hands really do stand in as a self-portrait. Here you see um, in Carl Handel's work, this is looks very photographic, but actually this is a pencil drawing or um, a charcoal drawing. And you can see that he's posing these hands not as kind of studies, but very much as kind of figures interacting, touching each other, dominating the page, creating dynamic positive and negative shapes. And then when you take into account how large he draws these hands, so this is an installation of a drawing show of his where you can see how large 
his drawings are of hands, you realize very clearly that um, this hand is a self-portrait or a, um, in this case, a portrait of somebody. So that the, he takes on these hands, he draws them life-size, they very much become portraits of um, the people that he is drawing. And the interaction of the hands speaks to kind of the relationship between these two people.